Good afternoon, everyone. I hope we are all doing well. And uh, I want to thank you all for joining us uh, for this seminar. Uh, we will be uh, listening in and collaborating or uh, discussing a paper by uh, our presenter today, whose name is Tim Gibbs. And uh, just by way of a brief introduction, uh, Tim has previously studied and worked at Wits University and uh, UKZN uh, and is now a associate professor in Commonwealth history at Paris Nanterre University. Uh, he will be presenting a, a paper titled Anatomy of a Municipality Meltdown revenues, redistribution, and political clientelism in post-apartheid South Africa. Um, and just uh, reading over the draft, I think it's going to be a really exciting presentation. Uh, and yeah, I can't wait to, to give you the listen and so that we can all as, uh, also participate in it. Um, so without any further delay, uh, if you could please take it away, Tim. Uh, thanks a lot. It's so nice to see uh, so many of you in this uh, virtual room, including people who know a hell of a lot more about Ums and uh than I do, uh, such as Mark Eprecht, whose uh, yeah, book I drew a lot upon um, when I started um, this research. Um, also, uh, yeah, to say, as one often does when it's a, a, a Zoom uh, seminar, um, I should perhaps uh, apologise in advance if my children come bursting uh, into this room uh, 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 as, 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 as these things tend to happen. Uh, let me just start by sharing my um, slides. Um, whoops, is that from the beginning? Is that working? Yeah, Chris? Thanks, great, lovely. Okay, um, so orientations, what am I trying to do in this paper? Um, I guess, as we all know, um, some of you far more than me, uh, post-apartheid South Africa um, had once one of the largest RDP um, public housing programmes in the world. Um, there will be housing, comfort, shelter for all, to recall the famous Freedom Charter. Um, so how might we understand this urban crisis today? Um, why are urban, crisis, uh, urban infrastructures breaking down? Um, municipalities in debt? Um, this crisis. Hence this paper on Peter Maritzburg and Zunduzi, a municipality that once was arguably one of the leading exponents of housing programmes intending to provide a right to the city, which would later become a hub of the Zuma radical economic transformation faction. Obviously this is a um, very live debate in South Africa today. And I just want to make a few quick points about the historiography of revenues and infrastructure, because I think South Africa has a very distinctive story, an interesting story to tell here. Because as we know, in the 1980s, rising housing rentals, transport fares, service charges, sparked sustained township revolts, reducing the infrastructure of urban apartheid to rubble. And in that decade, South African um, intellectuals wrote of popular struggles, drawing on that wider radical scholarship that spoke of the right to the city. 1994 elections mark a hiatus um, on the international conference circuit. Perhaps South Africa is best known for an iconoclastic coterie of postmodernist theories who are fairly indifferent to the sorts of practical urban infrastructures that uh, interest civil engineers. Yeah, I think the bulk of South African progressive academics, painfully aware that they lived in some of the most unequal cities on earth, remained resolutely interested in the nuts and bolts of urban government. Uh, many leaving academia to work closely with the incoming ANC government on uh, RDP programmes that they hoped then would serve to unite divided cities. 
obviously the debate moves on. And when I first came to South Africa in the early 2000s, it was a time when the so-called radical leftists, that looks left to you, uh, were worried about privatization, the commodification of basic services. More recently, as the fragility of municipal infrastructure became increasingly obvious, um, attention shifted from pro questions of protest to questions of governance. Um, plenty of judicial inquiries, media investigations into state capture and corruption. At the same time, a really interesting emerging academic debate on municipalities, on clientelism, on rent seeking, on gatekeeping politics. What I hope to do today is to take the debate in one direction by thinking about the taxes and revenues raised by city halls to fund these RDP programmes. As it's only relatively recently that South Africans have started to think about these sorts of fiscal compacts embedded in relationships of revenue raising and redistribution. Um, as I'm trying to show, and I'll return to this graph, uh, sorry, this chart here, what's fascinating about South Africa is that local municipalities were often chosen to be these engines of redistribution and RDP. Um, and crucially, very often 70, 80% of revenues being raised within the municipality um, being, uh, being re redirected to redistributive ends. So municipalities are at the heart, I think, of much of, of RDP. Um, why a focus um, on Peter um, Sanduzi? Well, one, as a Marquette Preps, a uh, very good book on, um, it's Edendale, um, says it's one of these sorts of secondary uh, towns and cities um, experiencing high rates of urban growth in the face of sustained poverty and unemployment where you tend to see fiscal crises the earliest. Um, second, because there is a very good um, set of um, not just academics, but um, reporters, um, a newspaper in the city, uh, NGOs um, that, 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 that have dug into these questions in details, which brings me on to a third reason. Um, one of my, uh, yeah, th this paper has been co-written, um, co-researched, um, with the old retired um, political editor of The Witness, Nalini Nadu, who um, sadly can't be with us today um, due to illness. I also want to make a quick um, um, uh, caveat, which is much of my thinking thus far in Nalini, we're not numbers people. Um, and uh, we've very recently uh, brought on Glenn Robbins on board with us um, to help us think more systematically about how we can uh, systematically count uh, revenues and RDP delivery. So anyway, it's good to see Glenn in the room as well today, I think. Um, the argument we're hoping to make um, in this paper today um, is that arguably there were three distinct political settlements uh, in Umzunduzi which traces an arc that takes us from the highest hopes of uh, Nelson Mandela's new democracy um, all the way through to uh, July 21 and the um, unrest that signalled the demise of Jacob Zuma. Um, so to, to, to tell you where this paper is going to go, um, we're going to start with the democratic transition uh, when the municipality particularly in the late 90s, was focused on upgrading um, informal settlements, talking about um, extending the right to the city to some of South Africa's poorest citizens, often working with NGOs. To secondly, um, when the new wall-to-wall -wall democracy, um, when the new municipalities come into force, um, we see a top-down political machine being built by a group of Jacob Zuma loyalists, who have a emphasis on building large greenfield RDP housing. Uh, to thirdly, in the dying days of the Zuma presidency, um, this RDP um, housing machine runs out of steam and a third set of RET um, politicians come to power, promising radical economic transformation, which brings us to the current crisis. Um, 
By way of introduction, for those of you who haven't kicked around KZN for some time, um, to recall that even by the standards of apartheid, uh, even by the standards of South Africa, uh, Peter Maritzburg experienced incredibly brutal ruptures to its political economy, its urban geography during apartheid. As late as the 1940s, it was a small cathedral city set into a rural landscape. It's only during the apartheid decades does the city transform into a smoggy hollow, polluting industries, um, ringed by half a dozen government-built townships, girdled by a much wider belt of informal settlement. When the crisis comes in 1980s, um, a time of farm evictions, a quasi-civil war between the ANC and Incarta um, that brings successive waves of refugees um, onto the fringes of the city. This means that by the early 1990s, the so-called Greater Peter Maritzburg Functional Region has a population of about half a million and some of the largest concentrations of informal settlement in the country. Yet if it was the best of times, it was also, sorry, if it was the worst of times, it was also the best of times. Mandela coming to power in 1994, promising a better life for all. Expanded, desegregated local municipalities seen as crucial engines of reconstruction and development. City halls responsible for delivering houses, water, roads, electricity. What this meant in practice, as we know, is the fragmented institutions of apartheid consolidated into um, wall to wall local democratic government. And what this very uh, sketchy uh, diagram shows is how, um, if we go over, whoops, here, um, is how the pre 1994 uh, whites only um, Peter Maritzburg City Council is enlarged into uh, what uh, three times the size um, taking in both the inner townships and the outer peri-urban chieftaincy. Um, one municipality, one tax base, one city, one tax base being one of the slogans of this era, this idea of, 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 of redistribution coming through um, municipalities. Um, important to note too, um, the importance of NGOs um, at, at, at this time during um, the transition period. And, um, and KZN is host to one of the best, the Built Environment Support Group, which um, does some of the earliest pilot projects in RDP um, using um, in-situ upgrading, um, doing self-help schemes, um, drawing on the new grants uh, that, that are there on offer. Um, BESIG starts with a small, you can see a small project at Peace Valley in the north uh, east of the, um, of, of, of the city. And then the mayor uh, of the time, Cloney Zondi, decides to go big at Edendale, um, this densely settled old mission station, which was at the heart of the housing crises, um, trying to bring together a group of NGOs, international aid agencies and the municipality all contributing expertise and funding to a large um, Edendale project, which would have been, if it had worked out, they thought um, the, the, the largest project on former uh, mission um, lands uh, in South Africa. Yet for all the um, hope uh, invested um, in, um, in, um, in, in, in grassroots development, um, it's very difficult um, to, 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 to put together these grassroots um, from below um, RDP projects in a city, um, rundown city, marked down by high levels of poverty, inequality and um, bureaucratic, um, bureaucratic lack of capacity. Um, most insidious, uh, particularly in these complicated grassroots schemes, is the time that it takes um, in mid-sized municipalities, short on qualified engineers, um, to, to, to put together um, small housing projects. Um, Umsunduzi, for instance, uh, I think Mark says this in his book too, 
never manages to count the number of informal settlements it has. And if you can't uh, count the number of um, housing that you need to, to, to rebuild, how can you ever create a coherent plan? Um, likewise, the municipality fails to construct a register of indigent households eligible to receive uh, free electricity. And what we see in Umzunduzi as elsewhere is impatient households illegally connecting into unauthorized, unauthorized into electricity grids as, 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 as they cannot wait, overloading crucial electricity components, um, destroying uh, the electricity grid and, 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 and most sadly of all, um, killing people, particularly children on a regular, on a very regular basis. The fact that the city never manages to get a grip on these unauthorized connections, I think is the clearest indicator of the fragility of this uh, RDP um, 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 vision. And of course, it's a human tragedy too. In any way, we get into a second phase of politics, we might say in the mid 2000s, when Jacob Zuma, a native son of KZN, busy building his base in municipalities across the province as part of his run for the presidency of South Africa. Um, Sanduzi, um, one of the first places where Zuma supporters seized the city hall in 2006, very ambitious, and they come to power looking to build a very different top-down model of, um, of RDP development that will deliver large housing projects to NC voters, whilst also distributing construction contracts and kickbacks to politically connected businessmen. Crucially, it's possible to build this sort of machine because as this graph shows, um, they're coming to power uh, in the 2000s um, when there is a surge of public infrastructure investment on the back of uh, the, 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 the commodity boom and South Africa's preparation for the World Cup. Um, the Zoomerites also have the good fortune of arriving in 2006 to power in Umzunduzi, just as a shakeup of local government powers are giving additional service delivery powers to their hands. So what we see across the city are, are, are large scale greenfields projects being developed um, to the south of um, Edendale at a, at, a, um, at, a, at a new township called France and crucially to the far west as well where one of the um, largest um, projects in, in, in the province is, is, is being built on Vulind Leila chieftaincy lands. Um, crucially, this is a project uh, by which the NC hopes to embed itself into this city that has been at the heart of the civil war, essentially creating um, housing companies and directorships and sinecures and shareholdings that will pay off um, old Inkata supporters, bring traditional leaders on board so that, as we can see, um, the ANC consolidates its, um, its, its, its um, hold on the municipality in the 2011 elections, crucially by defeating Inkata um, in the wards to the uh, far west of, of, of the city. The problem, though, being well, two things. On the one hand, we can see this in a very, perhaps a positive light. Um, the 2011 marks the, 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 um, the apogee of the ANC's power, its grip um, on KwaZulu-Natal. And as Nalini wrote at the time, um, this is a moment um, when in effect, the civil war uh, that has gripped the Natal Midlands uh, has finally comes to a close because the NC manages to, to, to gain political dominance over Inkata. Yet at the same time, um, this RDP housing machine, um, as various reports show so very well, um, the focus is so much on building housing, not always a very good standard, that critical operations and maintenance um, expenditures are essentially overlooked and forgotten. Um, because it's always easier for politicians to open uh, new projects, uh, win votes in that way, than doing the boring nuts and bolts of uh, O&M. And so in some sense, um, this political machine 
is something that creates a, a ruin as these houses get built it's almost like they're collapsing behind as well um and so it, in many ways a very fragile um political machine um, that the zoomerites conduct and in any case as we know by the mid 2010s we're entering a new terminal phase of the zuma presidency in which municipalities across south africa are running into trouble um, public and private infrastructure investments sagging in the decade that follows the um, global financial crash. I mean, just look, if you look at the red line, uh, the way in which public housing um, declines. Um, obviously, plenty has been written already about the sorts of popular protest that occurs when government housing cracks, water pipes run dry. This is also not just a sign of uh, growing service delivery protest, very important, it's also a sign of degrading bureaucratic, bureaucratic capacity and political sclerosis. And this is when um, the ANC party, I think, runs into blockage. Um, it has grown so quickly. Um, um, party membership, particularly in, in, in KZN, um, that as one municipal official put it to me, there were just too many spokes in the wheel. Um, there were just too many people taking party membership, hoping to, to, to gain tenders. Um, and, 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 and at this time of, of, of rising membership and declining infrastructure investment, there's just not enough to go, go around. Worse too, rivalries that were once directed against Incarta, and KZN is a pretty rough place to do politics, are now being turned inwards as ANC factions. They no, no longer have the disciplining force of having to face up to Encarta. They now turn in on themselves and squabble for positions inside bloated party structures. And in 2016, this is when the radical, uh, the RET faction come to power in Umzunduzi, um, chucking out the uh, fairly uh, mayor with clean hands, so Chris and Layla, putting into his place a um, hapless novice who uh, appropriately enough uh, was a township undertaker rather than a professional politician. He is the front man with the chains of mayor office but behind the scenes after 2016 uh, to Barney Zuma and Super Zuma, two um, crucial supporters of the embattled Jacob Zuma uh, are apparently running the municipality turning it into a stronghold of uh, the RET factions. I want to draw out um, two implications of this. Um, firstly, as infrastructural investment dips and a, a wider grouping of aspirant tenderpreneurs comes onto the scene, we see the emergence of kind of a mafia-like business forums whose smash and grab modus operandi is profoundly self-destructive. Um, we know this story best in Durban Etiquini, where Mayor Zandile Gomede is dubbed the gangster mayor. Um, something very similar happens um, in Umzunduzi. For instance, uh, you get business forms wanting RDP contracts who are storming government offices, intimidating senior officials whom they accuse of withholding vital tenders to them, uh, said Nalini in one of her articles. And as this sort of chaos um, uh, grips a municipality, you just see RDP housing projects stall, often terminally, um, with, um, for example, a hundred million rand housing project at Woodlands coming to a halt because one hapless set of subcontractors had built the top structures, the housing, before the first lot of contractors had um, put in the sanitation infrastructure. And as this sorts of um, RDP housing projects go awry, officials dither, looters start stripping uh, construction sites, RDP projects of metal pipes, wooden door frames to build their own settlements where they can on the fringes of the city. Second, as the politics of RDP um, tenderpreneurialism withers away, in Uns and Doozy, we see a new group of ANC politicians building their base um, in the burgeoning informal settlements. The ANC starts gerrymandering board boundaries to increase the, the importance of the votes. 
um, of these settlements. And some of these um, shack lords controlling um, these the, 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 the settlements are, 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 are pretty nasty. Um, they're, they're, there's one group um, just above the northern suburbs that keep on cutting down um, the uh, electricity pylons um, um, until they get electricity um, um, into their own uh, informal settlement. Um, this obviously comes at a, 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 a huge cost to any planning. Um, there's a lot, from what I understand, um, ANC veterans um, ringing alarm bells and, and, and telling political leaders we need to do something about this RET faction. Um, but from what I understand, um, ANC provincial leaders, um, the, these complaints, these worries fall on deaf leaders because ANC provincial leaders are busy conducting um, their, their, their own uh, land invasions, uh, four by four land invasions they're called, uh, building themselves, as you can see in that picture on the bottom right, building themselves their own uh, mansions on reserve, dam, uh, on reserve land around Henley Dam because now it's basically a case of sort of keeper, uh, grab whatever you can. And so this is how um, Sanduzi, to bring things to a close, um, Sanduzi goes towards a second uh, municipal meltdown in 2001, um, which would seem still to be terminal. And perhaps more broadly, this is speculation, how we slide towards the, the, the unrest of July, 2021, which I think we can see from the reporting um, is detonated by elements of that radical economic transformation uh, faction who have been already taking a grip inside municipalities uh, around uh, the province. Um, so anyway, this is where I end and, uh, and, and, and you begin to uh, tell me all your thoughts. So I really look forward uh, to, to, to the conversation. Uh, that follows. Um, thanks for your time. Thanks very much, Tim, for the very interesting presentation. Um, uh, need to bring it indeed. down. Let me see if I can. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, all good. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so indeed, I think we uh, uh, in store for some interesting discussion. Uh, yeah, I just want to open it up to the audience uh, for whatever questions or comments that you guys have. Okay, we have one from Noah. If Noah can go ahead. Yeah, great, uh, Chris, and thanks very much, Tim. Um, uh, Tim, I, I, I'm going to ask uh, probably a kind of typical historian's question. Um, and, and that is about the sort of underlying causes. Uh, one way of reading your periodization uh, is that it all comes apart at a certain point in time, which will be explained in quite a lot of interesting detail. But I'm wondering, you know, whether the kind of underlying causes, the roots of the problem can't be located in that earlier period which uh, could be read in your, uh, you, know, you know, obviously very quick, uh, uh, you know, description as a kind of golden period. Um, but surely the roots are, uh, are, are to be located there in the kind of late 1990s, early 2000s, because one could, uh, you know, interpret your analysis as saying that sort of it all goes pear-shaped when Zuma and the, uh, and the RET faction begin to take hold of the municipality. And no doubt that is, there's a fundamental truth in that. But I wonder uh, you know, to what extent the roots of the problem can be located to the earlier period. Um, uh, that, that uh, yeah, let me leave it at that, thanks. Uh, thanks, Noel. Um, do we have any other questions? Uh, it seems there's, there's one in the comments, uh, which maybe I'll just read out. Uh, thanks for this fantastic presentation, Tim. It's a very helpful anatomical inquiry. Speaking of the wall-to-wall -wall system, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about synchronization and alignment between local municipalities, 
district municipalities and the province, both on RDP, but on other service delivery efforts too. Okay. Yeah, just any, uh, another question perhaps or comment? Uh, okay, so maybe Tim, if you wanna yeah. answer those. Oh, yeah, two very interesting uh, questions to start with. And yeah, as, as, as Noel was uh, perhaps suggesting uh, when one gives one of these papers in 20 minutes, uh, there is a fairly, you know, simplification. Um, and and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm basically trying to show fairly crudely three forms of delivery, uh, which to some extent can be periodized. But of course, there are huge connections um, going across them. Um, in many ways, I think I would agree with what Noor is saying that um, even in the mid 2000s, when 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 the municipality is delivering um, RDP housing, um, it's it's the, the, this is a very fragile housing delivery machine for all sorts of reasons. Um, it, it can't produce a good uh large numbers of rdp housing uh due to all sorts of lack of capacity issues the way they um bring on um the the, the main contractor deso holdings uh, is its own very uh complex uh um, um not quite corrupt but 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 there have been some very good phds on 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 on, on the floors uh of of um this this building contractor that gets a lot of um, contracts in, in, in the municipality and you can't do any better than uh, read Mark's uh, EPREX book on Eden Dale, which will tell you a lot of, uh, if, about the, uh, the, the, the problems of that um, 2000s phase of RDP. I guess my question back to Noor would be, um, was there an alternative of um, grassroots um rdp um from below um as was the vision of the housing ngos of the early 1990s was that bottom-up vision possible in um skill short and fairly poor municipalities that's the question that's often on my mind um question about the alignment between local and district municipality i mean that's a really interesting one Ooh, and can be answered in all sorts of different ways. Um, one quick observation. Um, I guess what makes them Zanduzi different to many local municipalities in South Africa is it's a mid-sized city and it's able to raise um, its revenues, as, as, as my opening, one of my opening slides was, was, was alluding to. 78% um, of, of, of municipal revenues come from local rates. Um, this means that in a certain sense, um, Mzunduzi has a autonomy, um, a, 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 a capacity, ability to make fiscal compacts that many local municipalities that are much poorer and rely um, almost exclusively or for the vast bulk of their revenues come from, from, from transfers, uh, from, from, from ultimately from the national treasury. Um, this is what, what makes Umzunduzi different, as opposed to that relationship between local municipality and district municipalities. Well, there's some very good research um, being done by, gosh, um, it's Joel Pearson, isn't it? Uh, on, 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 on the way in which regional executive committees in the NC are often quite key locuses of power. So regional executive committee running, what, roughly a, a, the level of a district municipality and how that these RECs um, often are pulling the levers in many um, provinces, he would say. Um, I haven't thought a huge amount about that, um, but, but, but Joel's analysis of Limpopo um, seems persuasive uh, to me. So yeah, that's a really interesting question, uh, inadequately answered uh, by me, but yeah, very thank you. All right, great. Um... So we do we do have some more questions. Uh, I think you did answer both those initial comments, right? Um, in the chat. Um, okay. So then I think uh, we'll we'll have Emmanuel next. 
Hello, Chris, and hello, everybody. And um, and thank you for this wonderful opportunity to actually come in. And, and thank you for the wonderful presentations that you have on a weekly on a weekly basis. I'm truly honored to actually participate and actually listen in. You know, which I'm learning a lot. I guess I uh, meet time and time again. Mr. Tim, uh, sir, you you made a lot of points whereby um uh Sounds like uh, most of your research, I don't know if it's research, but most of, of your analysis is based on um, the same narrative that we, we see on the papers about uh, the RET and Zoom. So, which actually makes me to wonder, um, like because um like what I would like to believe is that this paper it is a research paper. Like I would like to believe it is a research paper, not a newspaper colon in a way. Um like when you were doing your findings, like um um what's your source of data or maybe like and also like did you also check like do a fact, like a fact finding, like did you interview some people from the municipality? Because it sounded like some of the things that you made um, sounded like, like most of the unfounded accusations that we read about on most occasions. I don't know if ever that is true. Like I don't want to suggest that like, and I'm asking a question. Um, and also, you spoke about the the July unrest. You related that as well to Mr. Zuma. And even up to this day, after this unrest, there is no there is no direct thing that directly implicates him with the July unrest. I don't know why is that because it's, I believe to say a research paper which which should be very objective we should weigh both sides and then it shouldn't be biased in its nature whereby it brings um things that seem to be alleged which are not um which are unfounded because there is no fact as well relating zuma to that and then um uh, political connected people, yes. Um, we have seen this within the ANC, I think, uh, through many different presidents from the time of Nelson, the time of Mbeki, Zuma, even right now, at the time of Ramaphosa, there are still people who seem to be alleged. Like, even today, there's a paper of of Sarah Ramaphosa's nephew having received a tender of over 300 million, something like that. It is alleged anyway. So like, I wonder why such a huge focus or emphasis on, on Zuma, because like it seemed like all these problems in the NC have been trickling down all the way from the times of Mandela to Mbeki, all the way to Ramaphosa presently even he has his own allegations, which some are not um, have not been like tested in a court of law. So to actually determine if ever they are factual or not. And then, yeah. So I would like to know, and then one last point, I'd like to, to ask you, like, can you please maybe in your own words, like try to explain or define what do you understand about RET, like uh, this so-called radical economic transformation system. Uh, yeah, that's one last point that I'd like to understand from you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Emmanuel. 
Uh, I see we, we do have more comments in the chat, but I think we'll get to that in the next round. First, we'll have Mark and Lucas, and then we'll go back to Tim. Uh, so, Mark, please. Yeah, hi, thanks, uh, Tim. That was uh, very, very interesting indeed. Uh, I see you did interview uh, Rob Haswell, the uh, deputy mayor from the time of the first wall-to-wall -wall, uh, administration. And uh, I'd be interested if you can comment on his thesis. I wonder if he shared that with you, uh, but um, the original wall-to-wall -wall was much bigger as you probably know, it went all the way to Howick and all those rich Northern suburbs were um, uh, cut out in the eventual map that you showed. And that removed a lot of the revenue that was going to uh, uh, support the ambitions of the, um, the original administration. And meanwhile, the city was uh, denied metropolitan status, although it had a lot of the costs associated with that, for example, the airport uh, and, and such things. So um, I'm just parroting uh, Rob here uh, to say that the city was hamstrung from the beginning and there are political reasons going back to 1994 uh, of factionalism within the ANC and also the need to make a deal with the, um, the IFP, which was opposed to a bigger Meritsburg. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and then lastly, Luke. Hi, um, uh, by comparison, mine is a fairly minor question, um, and it has to do with the commentary towards the end, specifically about people, uh, I think you described as shack lords, um, people who are sort of running informal settlements or groups of, uh, of shacks. Uh, and their forms of protest that they're participating in. Um, you sort of describe them as being closely or similarly aligned to the work of, say, the construction mafias and others that you, you describe. Um, but it's not 100% clear uh, how they differ from historic and current um, similar kinds of movements that work on that work in, in, in informal settlements that run informal settlements. Um, I, I was just wondering if you could put it into context and explain a little bit about some of the if there's any nuanced detail there that I'm missing. Thanks. Yeah, just received an instruction from Zoom to unmute myself. Uh, yeah, three, three, three fascinating um, questions. Maybe I can uh, rearrange them to, to, to make them flow in a, a logical order. Um, yeah, Mark makes a really um, important point, which maybe we can generalize a little bit further, um, and that will link to perhaps one of the questions, observations in, 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 in the chat, which is um, question. Um, do these municipalities have enough capacity, um, both technical and engineering, or as Mark also points out, in terms of revenues, um, to deliver on this, you know, huge, very difficult RDP mandate um, that they have been given? And um, yeah, exactly so. Um, um, Zanduzi, um or, or politicians inside um, Zanduzi feel that they were shortchanged um, and, and, and they certainly lost um, rich suburbs and small towns um, to 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 the north of, um, of 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 the municipality, uh, which would have uh, given additional revenue, additional capacity. Um, and Duzi always looks very jealously uh, to the coast, uh, to Etacrini, um, which had uh, A is richer and B has this you know important category A uh, metropolitan municipality status, which just allows it to do a hell of a lot more things. And more efficient. It also has a much stronger, for all sorts of interesting historical reasons, uh, a, a much stronger city hall, a much stronger engineering department, which allows um, the city to 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 drive um, a, 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 a much stronger um, RDP program in terms of housing numbers throughout the two thousands. I mean, I guess this is a question we could ask about many um, municipalities, um, couldn't we? Um, and, and yeah, it's it, it's a, a really difficult one. Um, final point, Umzanduzi has um, 
some of the um, largest, um, um, if, if I understand, some, some of the largest middle class flight out of um, suburbs within the, the municipality into these outlying um, peri-urban um, uh, towns full of uh, amazing artisanal coffee shops um, around Howick, um, as, 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 as you see a lot of suburban flight um, um, which of course drains the municipality of its base. I, I, I guess we see these sorts of debates in um, North American um, urban studies, don't we, uh, uh, about the size of municipalities. And Rosetta Queenie was able to reach out, Urbanetta Queenie was able to reach out and, and, and grab a lot of these um, suburban flight and, and, and bring that revenue back into the city, um, some doozy not. Um, which onto uh, Emmanuel's point, well, I guess what I hope I'm trying to do, um, I, I, even if you think I was naming and shaming and taking a far too personalised approach, I apologise if you think that. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to do is to try to put um, the crisis um, that we see in these words such as um, corruption and state capture um, into perhaps a longer historical context, trying to show the um, broader structural forces um, of how we get to, shall we say, 2016, when the RET faction uh, does come to power. I think that's a fact of record in KZN. Um, um, and the way in which um, an organized um, project of service delivery of the 2000s, um, far easier to organize at a time when you do have rising infrastructure development and, um, and, and, and that, that produces a lot of RDP housing how when the um, when 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 the structural situation in South Africa changes as a result of the financial crash um, and declining infrastructure, how these structural forces I think could be seen as being at the heart of um, a rise of, of of the new forces that we do see in KZN's uh, cities. RET. Well, I guess you can uh, define in different ways. Um, but I think perhaps one empathetic uh, way of thinking about it is, is that housing budgets, you know, typically are the largest chunk of a municipality's um, outlays, um, given the levels of inequality, given the way that emerging um, um, black economic empowerment firms are often shut out of private sector real estate development, RDP housing becomes uh, this, 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 this prime force around which um, the business of a city is organised. And I think it's interesting that both in Ums and Doozy and uh, at Equini, you see a fairly tight uh, organisation of RDP housing um, contracts in the 2000s around a number of larger firms. Um, but there's a lot of people <laughs> on the margin. Um, um, who, 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 want a, who want a slice of this action? And uh, and 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 um, and Zandi Ligamede, she talks about um, BE um, empowerment going up from was it twelve percent to thirty percent, which I mean thirty percent isn't even there. Um, and um, organising the, the, the these groups of uh, aspirant. Um, uh, te um, um, the, 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 these groups of as aspirant engineers and uh, construction firms. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to do is to attempt to avoid um, finger pointing, name calling, and, 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 and try to put these, the, 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 these news forces that we see emerging in South African politics into that, 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 that bigger perspective. Brings me on to Luke's Third point, shack lords. This is something of a speculative um, observation built around fairly tight observations of one or two particular flashpoints uh, in formal settlements to the north of Mzumzuzi that Nalini knows a hell of a lot more about uh, than I do. Um, and my sense is, and her sense is, I don't know how you would prove it either way, is that as housing delivery declines, then new forms of power are going to emerge in the city. Um, 
and perhaps the politics of, of organizing and distributing RDP contracts will become less important. And then therefore perhaps um, the politics of in organizing informal settlements will become something somewhat different maybe, and somewhat more important too. Um, this is something we discuss quite intensely, Nalini and I, and we think we've had it discussed and talked about by other housing groups too, such as Abeklali down in Durban. I've never seen any definitive research that can almost show the numbers and trajectories, but 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 I think our observations of um, Mzumzuzi correspond to what other housing activists uh, have described. Um, so yeah, yeah, that, that 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 three three very interesting points. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, interesting points indeed there. Um, I just want to turn some attention to the, the chat as well. Um, I don't know if you've gone over Mike's comment. Uh, too much government, too many levels, not possible to align budgets. Performance agreements, project delivery timeframes, battle for strong national and local government. No provincial sphere, lost in the early 90s, local government underfunded for huge mandate as a result, now district development model, but bound to fail for some reason, for the same reason rather. And then uh, lastly, Le Bohang saying, linked to your question of, was there a better way regarding RDPs? I'm, cu I'm curious as to what was happening on the other side of the N3. Was there a lost opportunity on spatial justice that could have been uh, co-sponsored by the largely white NGOs that were working with local government? Um, and then maybe we can also throw in Emmanuel again, just for a last question or comment. Well, thank you, Chris, and thank you, team, for the wonderful response. Um, I think you forgot my last question where I asked um, you to maybe explain what the RET is. And then because um, at, at the RET was not Jacob Zuma policy, was the ANC's resolution. Like even right now in December, the ANC is going to, to a conference. Whatever resolution that they take or make there, it will not be a Ramaphosa resolution or policy. It will be the, the ANC's policy that they have resolved in this coming conference. So like, can you please explain what this policy is like in your own understanding? So I just want to, to see that. Thanks a lot, team and, and everybody. Thanks, Emmanuel. Uh, yeah, Tim, go ahead. Yeah. Um... Yeah. So yeah, um, Emmanuel. Yeah, I mean, point, point, point taken that the uh, R R E T is a, um, I guess, a, it, it's a term thrown around a lot. Uh, it's a term that will be defined uh, by uh, the A N C um, uh, if, if resolutions go through um, in, in in this upcoming conference. I guess what I was trying to to, to get back to. Um, what I was trying to suggest is, is that um, if you would allow me to take one or two steps back rather than get into the nitty gritty of, 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 of these debates and contestations that are going on in the ANC at the moment, I guess the broader point that I am trying to make, the wider point I'm trying to make about RET is that if we step back, um, RDP public um, investment, as, 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 as you said yourself, has, has been a really important um, form of accumulation um, and transformation. And you're right, I mean, so many political figures, uh, I think you were naming uh, one of Ramaphosa's children, um, uh, have connections to it. And so the, the point I'm trying to make here is that I think we can identify um, two, um, two, two, two phases. Um, one in which RDP contracts are tightly organised into um, 
in, in, into uh, or channeled through RDP contracts are channeled through a small number of subcontractors, large engineering firms in some municipalities, often historically white. Um, and understandably, um, given um, the, the, the way South Africa's political economy looks like, um, there, there is an understandable demand um, emerging in the early 2000s. We see this particularly in um, Etta Queeney uh, with Zandili Gamede and her definition of RET, where she talks about opening up um, these public um, contracts um, a to a much wider group of um, of, um, of 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 BEE um, subcontractors and be um, having a, a a larger chunk of 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 the project from twelve to thirty percent. I think these, uh, if 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 you would allow me to um, try to argue this or, or, or take this point in my own way, uh, is th these are the broad structural forces around a broader set of aspirant contractors uh, driving um, um, a a ANC policy from, from the 2010s onwards, very understandable in, 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 at a time when um, economic growth is declining, uh, when infrastructure overall is going down. Um, so yeah, um, this links to um, the other point um, that was made by Le Bohang. Um, gosh, really difficult question. Could 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 there have been a, another form of grassroots development um, sponsored by largely yeah NGOs which were largely white at that time? That, that's a really difficult question. I guess my It's a really interesting question. And can I pivot slightly by saying I was thinking about Lula, you know, President Lula of Brazil recently talking to some Brazilian urbanist friends um, who were telling me that the reason that the, the idealistic progressive left have stayed with Lula, despite all the problems and going to jail that he has had, is that Lula always found a space for these sorts of progressive NGOs um, in his development um, thinking. Um, and it seems to strike me that the ANC in the early 2000s um, shut out a lot of NGOs and a non-government organization of not just RDP housing, um, but also, shall we say, the delivery of water services. Um, so, so, so there is a Brazilian trajectory counterpoint that would perhaps um, suggest that your thoughts, um, your suggestions might be possible in other places, whether or not it could happen in, in South Africa, uh, given as you say, um, uh, the way that the NGOs weren't always of the ANC, also, given the fact perhaps that um, um, these sorts of housing development do require a hell of a lot of technical capacity um, that mid-sized um, municipalities don't always have, and those might be points against, but it's a really interesting question. Then uh, Mike Kenyon's comment, fascinating one. Uh, and um, if I were to follow on from that, it's fascinating that when um, discussions of quote unquote failed municipalities are raised. You always get uh, from the center, um, treasury officials and like saying, damn it, we need to centralize and bring everything back because you know the center knows best, um, the treasury will always know best. Um, but when you meet um, officials and activists and um, on the ground, uh, I mean, Mike, you've got your own very deep hinterland in Eastern Cape, um, um, and policy making, um, they see the way in which um, these the, these directives and plans, um, which so often have come down from the centre, has left led 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 to a misalignment. Um, so 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 yeah, I, I I completely agree with what you're saying. Yep, three very interesting questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Tim. Uh, yeah, some some interesting 
discussions coming out of this. Uh, and maybe we can now, uh, you know, close off um, with with uh, another comment by Glenn uh, saying, uh, worth noting that although Sundizi councillors wanted to retain Hilton for revenue purposes, the inclusion of this area and surrounding communities would have brought in largely non-ANC voters. Rob Aswell and Mike Sutcliffe uh, debated this, did the benefit of additional revenue outweigh the risk of some political dilution. Uh, on top of this, the surrounding local municipalities also needed revenue associated with Hilton, Howick, et cetera, for them to be somewhat more viable. Um, and then maybe if I can also just throw in my own question as well, just to, just to end things off. Um, so in your, your abstract, you mentioned uh, that the paper argues that uh, uh, more could be uh, 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 well, well, that more can be found by by as opposed to corruption in the ruling party. So, just based on that approach, what would you say are the the limitations that you've encountered, or just in your research as well, what were the limitations? Uh, yeah, I think if there's no other questions, then maybe we could close off with those. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, Glenn, yeah, really good point. Yeah, com 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 completely agreed. I'd heard uh, similar things myself, um, particularly on the fiscal front, you know, um, how are the even deeper rural areas uh, going to be floated um, if you didn't have um, other local municipalities with places such as Howick at their centre? Um, I, I, I guess this spatial inequality uh, was a huge question faced by those people who were drawing up those water wall, um, yeah, uh, like lo local democratic government uh, organising the municipalities back then. And many of the questions they asked and perhaps weren't able to quite resolve are ones that play through up to the present time. Um, Chris, it's a really interesting point. Allow me to say something perhaps somewhat unfair, perhaps somewhat spectative, perhaps somewhat controversial, which is that, shall we say, from what, the 1960s, 1970s onwards, South Africa has been wonderful about writing about resistance, you know, the key word um, um, to apartheid. And, and, and then when um, the post-apartheid government came along, um, resistance to the ANC, um, um and service delivery protests so 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 questions about resistance and protest um have lain at the heart of south african writing for for decades and decades i guess there is this shift going on at the moment to thinking about questions of governance um and i guess there is one version of um talking about governments which hones in on um corruption it's that kind of <clears throat> shall we call it the daily maverick headline or the merlin guardian um, headline which you know endless stories about corruption and personal um and 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 and, and personalized um descriptions of criminality I, I i guess what lots of um south african academics are doing in different ways <clears throat> and why it's so fun to be well fun is the wrong word why it's so interesting to be part of this conversation is as we all try to conceptualize patterns of governance and rent seeking uh, relations between patrons and clients um, in this fast developing situation that, that, that take us beyond take us beyond uh, headlines of scandal to think more about broader structural issues um, 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 that, 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 that have been faced by you know a post apartheid polity which remains one of the most unequal in in in, in the world um it was always going to be very difficult uh, for rdp for reconstruction development um plans to embed in, in 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 such a society and so i think all the questions and discussions we've had um have have, have, have been part of this emerging strand of conversation and research that i know uh, from reading much of your work uh, I see people in the room who've written all sorts of stuff that have uh, 
are, are contributing to this and, and uh, fascinate me. So, uh, uh, yeah, that that, that 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 that's where I see my work uh, contributing to, to to this new discussion um, on, on on South Africa. It's almost like we look at a, a post-apartheid period, you know, that has run a generation, um, a generation of infrastructure of the 2000s and decline and um, and, and, and God knows where it goes next uh, in the next elections. Will, will this then go into a post post apartheid period and will these discussions of governance and clientelism and patronage and rent seeking almost become historical questions as, as, as we look back at a phase of of um, South African politics that, that, that soon turns into history. Um, I don't know if we stand on a, a point of historical change. I fear we do. So anyway, well, not, not, not a very happy way to end, but uh, I guess we all feel that um, and perhaps think these thoughts too. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Tim. Um, yeah, indeed. Uh, 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 there's a lot to, to, I suppose, look for. I don't know if you can say look forward to, but, uh, you know, in terms of the next elections and so forth, like, as you say. Um, but I just want to say uh, thank you, Tim, for the very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Thanks, everyone, as well, for your questions and, and contributions. Um, yeah, it's been a really uh, great seminar. Thank you. Thank you. I learned so much. Uh... Uh, so yeah, thanks for organising it. Um, really enjoyed it. Thanks. Cheers, everyone. Yeah, I've just gone and uh, copied uh, all your um, comments uh, uh, that, that were in there. Yeah. <laughs> <It'll be laughs> useful later. <laughs> very useful, very useful, yeah. as, as, as for the recording. Sure. You know, yeah. yeah. Hi, hi. Just before everybody goes, um, can I just uh, chip in? If this is Liz Carmichael, um, I've just been around South Africa launching a book on the National Peace Accord of 1991, and. Um, the comments and reactions exactly chime in with what you've just been saying, Tim. Um, there's a new conversation. The peace accord is seen as a social compact that worked in that time with a lot of civil society leadership. And what can be done now? And what are the issues? And the issues are, as you said, governance, integrity in governance and public life, and competence and uh, that will help everybody. You did a lot of work, didn't you, up around Alexandra, if I <clears throat> remember. And um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember, yeah, yeah. comments were conversations with Phil Bonner and Norni Fdachodian um, <laughs> about, yeah, that, that Alexandra moment and, and then the sorts of politicians who took over RDP projects um, what, in the 2000s. Um, who are some of them flying fairly high uh, in the ANC at the moment as we speak. Um, yeah, well, the problem was the RDP seemed to be cancelled and then just simply fragmented. Yeah, yeah, it was at the Alexandra Reconstruction Programme, wasn't it, the ARP? Um, oh, well, that was, um, that was Julian Baskin later on, and even he couldn't manage <laughs> Alex. <laughs> <laughs>